here to introduce Dr. Stephen Larrabee, talk about a very pertinent issue, and that is the, the kind of nexus between what's going on here in Washington, Ankara, and the, the war in Syria, civil war in Syria. Uh, Dr. Larrabee with the RAND Corporation and has served in both private uh, sector and in the government. And I will let, since we're late, I will let you go ahead. All right, thank you very much. Uh, what I'd like to try to do in my remarks is focus on the impact of the Arab Spring on Turkish policy, then say a word or two about how the S Syrian crisis has affected Turkish policy and also the United States, and then finally look at some ways in which the crisis could evolve and what the implications of each of these future scenarios might be for the U.S. and uh, for Turkey. But first let me start with the, the Turkish aspects. Uh, the Arab Spring has really, in my view, shattered the basis of Turkish policy towards the Middle East. The Vitoglu's zero problems strategy was predicated implicitly on the assumption that the status quo in the Middle East would more or less continue and that Turkey would be dealing with most of, the, if not all, of the same leaders. So therefore, the, the calls for democracy that were unleashed by the Arab Spring undermined the authoritarian regimes and resulted in the disappearance uh, and death in some cases of the leaders in Egypt, Tunisia, and Libya, the death of Gaddafi. But they created a completely new political context. Turkey was forced in many ways to scrap its old policy and develop a new approach and a new framework for its policy. This new framework has put greater emphasis on the aspirations and popular attitudes of uh, the population as well as the nature of the regime. And that is a major difference because the zero problems policy, successful as it was in its time, did not put much emphasis on the nature of the regime. Take the case of Syria, which was in fact probably the centerpiece of the zero problems policy. Uh, relations with Syria in, uh, improved significantly after 1998, up until recently. But they did so despite the fact that during that whole period, the Assad regime was highly authoritarian and certainly gave very little uh, weight to the, as uh, the aspirations of the population. Similarly, if you look at Turkey's policy towards Iran, uh, Turkey, again, policy improved significantly in the last five or six years, up until recently. But Turkey did not insist uh, on any kind of democratic evolution and indeed did not support openly the uh, opposition that arose after the presidential elections in 2009. Uh, Turkey was one of the first, if not the first, to congratulate Ahmes, uh, Ahmadinejad and it was very cautious and did not support uh, the opposition as I mentioned. Now, the Syrian crisis forced a change in many ways in Turkish policy. Erdogan, when the unrest first began in Mar March of 2011, Erdogan tried to encourage Assad to carry out certain reforms which would, he, he hoped and thought, reduce the amount of unrest and lead to some evolution of the nature of the regime. This effort, however, failed. Uh, 
Devataglu's visit to Damascus in early August 2011 was an important turning point. Devataglu essentially came back from Damascus empty-handed and thereafter Turkish policy shifted uh, and, and Turkey embarked upon an effort to essentially topple Assad. This effort has proven to be much more difficult and has had a number of unforeseen consequences uh, that it's been much more difficult than the Turkish leadership expected and has had unforeseen consequences. First of all, I would say Erdogan made several miscalculations. First of all, he underestimated Assad's resilience and assumed that Assad would be would be would fall within three or four months before the end of 2011, and in, in many ways was probably influenced to a certain extent by the experience in uh, Libya, because in Libya, Erdogan was in fact rather late in joining the effort to see, uh, to overthrow uh, Gaddafi. Uh, if you remember, uh, Erdogan did not uh, support initially uh, arming the rebels. He was opposed to NATO uh, involvement. And indeed, Turkish relations with the uh, rebels were very bad at the, at the very beginning. But based on that experience and the fact that the rebels did, with the help of uh, the West and with NATO and also Qatar and the United Arab Emirates, it was able, that effort was in the end successful. And I think that, he, that Erdogan expected that something like this would happen, that eventually the regime would collapse. Not, and therefore he, he underestimated the resilience of uh, Assad. S secondly, Turkey overestimated, and Erdogan overestimated, Turkey's ability to shape developments in the crisis. The Syrian crisis in many ways has exposed the limits, in my view, of Turkey's ability to shape and, and to influence developments in the Middle East. Turkey has been forced to recognize that without support of the United, strong support from the United States, and without the uh, strong American engagement, Turkish options are limited. And that's what I think you're seeing now, a recognition that the situation is quite different. Uh, the tone of Turkish statements is quite different than it was a year ago. Gone, in my view, is the uh, hyperbole of, of about Turkey's ability to play the role of a regional power and so forth. There's a much more subdued attitude and a much more concerned and frustrated attitude. Thirdly, I would argue that Erdogan misread U.S. policy. He expected a much stronger response from the United States than the uh, Obama administration has evidence. And some of this is clear from Erdogan's um, interview with Christiana Anapur back in early September, where he criticized the lack of a U.S. initiative and complained obliquely, but nonetheless quite and quite clearly, that the United States, in his view, was not acting uh, as if it were a really the way a major uh, power should should act. Now Obama was reluctant, in many ways, of course, because of the presidential election. But I think even after the election is over, 
if he wins. I would not expect American policy to change all that much, except if it is driven, except being driven by events themselves. But left to his own devices, I think the administration is going to be very cautious about getting involved, in part because the United States is still dealing with the aftermath of Iraq and also, also uh, Afghanistan. There's a concern very strongly, which has been reinforced in recent days, about uh, arming the rebels. One, because we don't really have a good, uh, we, the United States, does not have a very good understanding of who the opposition in Syria is, how strong it is, what its background is. And there's a concern based particularly on the experience in Afghanistan at, after the end of the, uh, when the Soviets withdrew, the United States sent a lot of sophisticated weaponry to uh, the Afghan rebels. Much of this was then used against the United States later on. So this whole experience psychologically is rather strongly embedded in many of the people who are uh, in policy making positions. They don't want to see a repeat of that kind of Afghan experience. For all these reasons, I think that the U.S. will be more cautious, has been more cautious and will be more cautious, but the, the fact of the matter is that Erdogan expected, in my view, a stronger reaction from the United States. He didn't get it, and in a way Turkey has been left hanging to a certain extent uh, by the fact that it has not had the strong backing and support uh, for its policy uh, that it ha had expected. Now, if you look at the situation in Syria, I would say there have been two major winners, you know, winners at, uh, or benefactors. The first has been the Syrian Kurds. They see a kind of historic chance or opportunity to gain a degree of autonomy similar to that of uh, the Kurds in Iraq. <laughs> That's, I think, their, their basic goal. And they have some reason to believe that under certain circumstances they may be able to achieve that. This, of course, if they were able to achieve it, it would have an impact on developments in Turkey, and particularly among the Turkish Kur uh, Kurdish population in Turkey. If the Iraqi Kurds can have uh, autonomy, <coughs> and if then the Kurdish Tur uh, Kurds obtain autonomy, why would it not be the, uh, the Kurds in in Turkey will continue to press uh, for greater autonomy and it will be harder, much harder to uh, keep that uh, under control uh, if the Kurds in Syria regain autonomy. The second winner, in a way, not, not winner but benefactor, I would say has been the PKK. Here I think you uh, have seen over the last six or eight months, but particularly since the summer, uh, an increase in PKK attacks, uh, a much more assertive policy on the pa part of the PKK, and also signs that s both Syria and uh, Iran are supporting the PKK in a more active way than they have in the past, in the most recent past. So what you're, the danger from Turkish point of view is a return to the situation that occurred in the 1980s and 1990s where uh, Syria strongly supported uh, the PKK, Erdogan was 
uh, given safe haven in uh, Damascus. Uh, the training camps were allowed for the PKK and so forth. So the danger is that you'll move back towards a situation like that, which obviously from the Turkish point of view uh, it was, is not uh, something that's, that's very desirable. So Turkey now is in a situation where it is quite exposed in which the policy that it pursued has ended up uh, creating, or not creating, but reinforcing and strengthening a pro the Kurdish problem, and at the same time has, in a way, led to a more assertive policy by the PKK. And as uh, Semi Edish, who is one of the correspondents for a well-known commentator from Milliet, noted not too long ago, and I'm quoting, having started with the aim of having no problems with its neighbors, Turkey has ended up with serious problems with almost all of its neighbors. So what has begun to emerge is a much more, much greater discontent and dissatisfaction and criticism internally of Turkish policy because the results of the Erdogan government's policy, policies have in fact, in many ways, objectively speaking, exacerbated uh, the problems that Turkey, security problems that Turkey faces. This wasn't intended, but in fact, for a variety of reasons, that has, that has been the case. Now a lot will depend of, on the outcome of the Syrian crisis and the crisis, in my view, can evolve, if we try to look at it, in a number of different ways. There are, in my view, f there are more, but I would highlight five different uh, kind of political futures in what, uh, that could evolve and what they might portend for um, West Western interests and U.S. And, and Turkish interests in particular. The first would be a palace coup. That would take place with, and essentially would be, uh, come about where the Alawite leadership essentially ousts Assad and then negotiates a ceasefire. This, however, would essentially be Assadism without Assad. Uh, this would produce a government that was fragile, not likely to last very, uh, very long. Uh, you would still have significant opposition uh, to it. The divisions and disunity that exist in the opposition now would likely to hinder any progress towards political reform. Turkey would still, under that uh, situation, be uh, faced with a continued refugee exodus uh, because the opposition would still be very strong to the government. And this Assad is gone, but the, the nature of the regime has not really changed. And therefore, the opposition to it would uh, continue. Regional instability under this uh, scenario would remain high. Again, the large refugee exodus would continue. Iran would still maintain significant influence. So that, even though some of my colleagues, uh, former colleague, uh, have uh, suggested uh, Sal Khalizad, that uh, a pa the U.S. should stimulate a palace coup. I think, first of all, it is not likely to bring much of an improvement. And second of all, the time for this is probably past. The time when a palace coup might have taken place was when some, uh, 
weeks ago when the uh, assassination of the defense minister took place. Uh, now I think it's pretty well overtaken by events. A second scenario or future could be what I would term regime collapse. In this situation, very much like the Libya model, Assad somehow ex uh, killed or goes into exile and government authority collapses as it did in Libya. Now again, this is certainly probably a better outcome than the palace coup in this, but the divisions and disunity in the opposition uh, would continue uh, to hinder progress towards political reform. There would likely to be major struggle for power among competing groups, and this government too would also be probably rather short-lived. Uh, well, certainly the longevity of it would be uh, open to question. So you, on one hand, uh, you would have uh, a better chance of moving forward with reform, but in actual fact, the likelihood of real progress towards reform would be minimal because of the uh, disunity and disorganization among the opposition. A third possibility would be a prolonged civil war and basically a prolongation of the situation that exists now. In this scenario, the violence and sectarianism would increase. Neither side would be able to establish a military dominance. Internally, this would result in escalating violence, uh, the collapse perhaps of any in, uh, internal government authority, possible emergence of warlordism. The regional impact would be very strong danger of violence and instability and spilling over into the neighboring uh, states and you'd continue to have and probably increased actually uh, refugee uh, situation. So again, this uh, prolonged uh, uh, stalemate would in fact, in my view, make it almost impossible to have a stable transition. Because the longer what the sec uh, sectarian violence goes on, the more <coughs> difficult and the more bloodshed that is likely to take place, the more difficult it will become as after it has gone on for such a long time to establish any kind of stable uh, transition. So the status quo, more or less what we have now, is in my view not sustainable and not some, uh, I think this has probably been one of the biggest uh, mistakes that the administration has made to think that somehow by staying out of the conflict that somehow uh, this would make it better. I think it is more, the longer it goes on, the uh, less chance there is of uh, any kind of stable government. Another option, a fourth option, that one might uh, see is what I would call the fragmented state. In this uh, scenario, the Kurds would have get autonomy in some parts in the north, and the Alawites might in some way retreat into uh, an area along the, the, the border, and they would have a kind of rogue uh, Alawite part of the, uh, of the country. In a way, a kind of, this is the Georgian model, where you had a South Ossetia and uh, Abkhazia 
legally, formally part of Georgia, but with the government unable to control it. So you, in this scenario, you would have a weak uh, Sunni government, come, uh, but unable to control, uh, with very little control over the Alawite area. Now, I mean, I realize that the Alawites, particularly in Damascus and other areas, are very much intermingled with the population, but it still would be a, you know, possible that they might set up their own uh, rogue uh, un uh, entity and so forth. This, again, would be highly uh, unstable. Uh, the fragmentation of Syria along these lines could set a precedent for other um, uh, countries. Um, the creation of an autonomous Kurdish region, as I said, would obviously have implications for Turkey and increased pressures from the Kurds in Turkey to uh, do this, uh, conduct the same thing. So again, if you look at th this, this is not a very stable situation. The last uh, future that one might look at would be if S Assad were to prevail. I think it's highly unlikely, but for the sake of argument, one could look at it. And here, again, you would have a danger of uh, violence and spillover, uh, destabilization of the region. Uh, Turkish-Syrian tensions would intensify. Turkish-Iranian strains would also increase. So they would end up again with a situation that is very high, unstable. Now, barring Western intervention, the most likely outcome, in my view, is either a prolonged civil war or a fragmented state. That's barring Western intervention. Even if Assad is ousted, Syria is likely to face a prolonged period of instability and sectarian violence. And as I mentioned, the longer the conflict goes on, the greater the likelihood of reprisals and violence, and the more difficult the transition to a stable democratic government will be. The divisions in the opposition are so strong that they are likely to be a major obstacle to progress towards political reform and a stable government. Very hard to see how you're going to create a, a stable government uh, there. There's an increase, there would be an increasing danger of the spillover, as I said, uh, into the other areas uh, bordering, particularly Lebanon and Turkey, although obviously the impact on Lebanon would be much uh, stronger. And I think there are if that were to continue along these lines, one of the things that you would see is an increasing tension and strains in U.S. relations with Turkey. Because Turkey is on the front line. It, it doesn't want, uh, and certainly would avoid, if it can, taking any kind of unilateral a action. The, there's not support, in my view, uh, for such action among the Turkish population. But Turkey will want and will expect the United States to take stronger action. And as I said, I am skeptical of whether the administration, uh, not of course, it, it depends on if whether Obama wins to a certain extent. But even if he wins, I think the United States will resist getting too deeply involved. I don't think it will be possible, however, for them to resist that. I think that the uh, 
facts on the ground and the developments will force the United States to get more actively involved. But the inclination of the administration, it seems to, to me, is to try to avoid getting involved milita uh, militarily. So let me stop there and we can then discuss this and have questions. Um, I forgot to introduce myself at the beginning of the, thank you very much for a really cogent uh, presentation with seemingly nothing but poor choices <laughs> that everybody has, that, that everybody is left with. My name is Jonathan Landa, I'm a senior national security correspondent with McClatchy Newspapers. I was supposed to indulge in a Q&A with Dr. Larrabee, but because of the stake of time, I think probably you have more questions than I do, but I'm going to use my prerogative to ask at least one. Um, the idea that as this situation deteriorates and gets worse, uh, that the United States will have no choice, uh, not just because of the situation, but because uh, its, its alliance with Turkey uh, could very well be at stake, uh, it, or at least strained. Sure. What kind of choices does the United States have if this thing gets worse? Um, uh, it seems that Libya, the experience with Libya is very, uh, aside from the election, the experience in Libya is, is dictating a lot or is influencing a lot of the choices that the administration is unwilling, uh, is willing or unwilling to make. Um, and second of all, how does, if, as, as Turkey watches the situation deteriorate, uh, how does it deal with that and, and does the whole uh, uh, article, article 5 of the Washington Treaty, does that an ultimate fallback position for the Turks if they get so frustrated that they basically say we've had, you know, we've we've taken attacks on our soil. We're going to we're going to call the NAC together and we want an Article Five um, action. Well, you've seen uh, they have had two on two occasions now had consultations with uh, NATO, and there's been a roaring. There's been no roaring enthusiasm on the part of NATO, obviously, to get involved. Uh, although the latest statements are, they support that NATO has supported uh, Turkey, and it says it supports it, but it made very clear that they're not about to get involved militarily. Now, this is perhaps one of the most significant and dangerous issues uh, because. If Turkey gets the impression that it cannot rely on NATO uh, to support it uh, in what is essentially a treaty obligation uh, on Article 5, which calls for uh, if there's an attack on one member, uh, it calls for collective action, including uh, the possibility of armed uh, intervention. But if Turkey gets the impression that it can't rely on NATO, this will have a very serious impact on Turkish policy. Now, there have been two issues like this in the past. One was during the Gulf War when uh, Turkey wanted an ace mobile force moved uh, to uh, its territory to protect it against uh, Iraq. Uh, there was a lot of toing and froing about that. The Germans, in particular, didn't uh, were very skeptical. Same thing happened again when uh, the United States invaded Iraq. Uh, there was a major debate about the question of stationing and moving Patriot missiles uh, to Turkish uh, territory. And the impact of this psychologically on Turkey in both cases is very negative. The question, and you can see this if you look at the German Marshall Fund polls from 2004 to now, there has been a very sharp deterioration in or decline in Turkish support for NATO, pop popular support for NATO. 
uh, somewhere f around 2004, you had about 60 some percent. That has dropped down recently to around 35, 37 percent. And most of this has been because there is a feeling that uh, among many Turks that NATO will not come to Turkey's aid and that they cannot rely on NATO. And one of the potential downsides of this could be if Iran were to get nuclear weapons. Uh, Turkey then, it seems to me, inevitably would have a debate about whether it should acquire nuclear weapons or not. I'm not saying it would seek to acquire them, but the issue would then become a live issue in a way that, in some ways, the way it has in Japan. Uh, Japan. Uh, Japan does not have nuclear weapons. It still relies on a guarantee by the United States. But the debate has intensified in recent years as China has become strengthened because there's a feeling, can we rely on the United States? In this sense, it, the same thing, I, in my view, will exist if Iran gets nuclear weapons then, uh, or has a nuclear capability. Saudi Arabia, Egypt will at least begin to look at their options. The whole situation in the Middle East uh, then could be uh, quite different. And it would be inevitable that Turkey would begin to examine this issue. Now, I'm not saying again that it would uh, necessarily decide to do it, but even a debate in uh, Turkey uh, about this would have, I think many of you would uh, understand, a major impact on a number of countries, particularly Greece, <laughs> but um, Armenia and other co countries. So that's, that's an issue that's out there that could begin to em emerge. What are, you, what are the options? I have argued and I, I, that the danger of inaction is, as uh, we've reached a point where the danger of inaction is more problematic uh, than actually taking action, action. Because as I said, if you look out and you say, what are the likely ways in which this can, uh, Syria crisis can evolve? The two most likely options are either a p continued prolonged civil war or the fragmented state. In each of these cases, the situation continues to deteriorate. Uh, the chances of the United States being, uh, the, the chances of any kind of stable, evolutionary democratic transition are uh, very limited. The resentment against the United States for not helping the rebels is likely to increase. I put it this way, if Assad goes, and eventually I think he will, may take a long time, the rebels will remember not what the United States did, but what it did not do. And you're di in my view, you're, you will end up with a situation where you have the worst of both worlds. We didn't help, and therefore the rebels uh, come to po power, weak perhaps and disorganized as they are, but with a feeling that they can't rely on the United States. So the ability of the United States to shape and influence the post-Assad transition, therefore, would decline. Uh, if we're really interested in trying to move things in a positive direction, then I think a more active and assertive policy is necessary. 
uh, I understand and uh, certainly agree that uh, one has to try to keep the weapons out of the hands of Al-Qaeda and other forces, but it does seem to me that the possibility to do that is n not beyond the uh, ability of the United States, that the United States could work more um, effectively with uh, Saudi Arabia and Qatar, Qatar uh, to I don't want to say ensure, but to certainly to influence the degree to which uh, the uh, the groups to which these weapons go. But to sit back and watch this situation deteriorate risks, as I say, uh, a rising resentment of the rebels, strains in our relationship. Uh, with uh, Turkey, and these costs are things you have to take into consideration when you consider whether you want to take some action or not. And so far, the attitude has been to let things simmer, but I think we're uh, at a, uh, we've reached a kind of turning point, a tipping point, where a more assertive uh, policy on the part of the U.S. is necessary. I throw it open to questions. As a follow-up, um, my name is Burak Kararte. I'm from the Turkish Embassy. Uh, as a follow-up to your remarks, you know, you need uh, you pointed out that um, a turning point is required for U.S. Uh, to revise or review its policy options vis-a-vis -vis Syria. So, I would appreciate having your thoughts on what could be um, this turning point for the U.S. administration. What could change the administration mind in order to review its policy and uh, and possibly to take a stronger action uh, on that issue? Thank you. Hi, my name is Iman Al Tamimi, and uh, can you speak um, up? My name is Iman Al Tamimi, and I'm a student. Uh, I was wondering, actually, about um, the few couple weeks uh, suggestion of the. F Turkish Foreign Minister about Fashar as a possible or as an option for Syrian to be to lead the new government, Syrian government. On what basis the foreign Turkish Foreign Minister suggested that such as Syrian character to lead the future of a uh, transition future of Syria? Do they plan for a future? Do they have a basis that or a signs that the Assad will collapse and they are preparing or for a shark to take a place? And that's all. Thank you. Can I ask you, it wasn't quite clear to me, when you say they, who do you, uh, who is they? The Turkish Turks. and uh, okay. Dodoglu who suggested shark a few weeks ago as an option for the transi transition Syrian government. Okay. To the question of what would it take uh, to get the United States to change its uh, policy? I mean, first of all, the, the election has to be over. And then <laughs> the recognition, as I said, that doing nothing will allow the situation to get worse and that the ability to the, of the United States to shape and influence this uh, situation in Syria in a positive direction will decline be, uh, if the United States does not begin to join uh, and take uh, more assertive action. Again, looking at down the road, uh, what's the likely, uh, how is this likely to play out? As I said, it's likely to play out that you have a continued military stalemate. Assad may eventually go, but uh, the, the by that time, uh, the situation will have so deteriorated 
uh, there will have been so much bloodshed and there will be such uh, sectarian violence that it will be practically impossible to put together a coalition government because that government has got to have some representation of the Kurds, of the Alawites, uh, some perhaps in the Christians as well, and that uh, it's been hard enough now uh, to get uh, the uh, opposition to uh, be more inclusive. If the violence increases, as it inevitably will if, it go, if this situation goes on, it will become even harder. And again, the ability of the U.S. to influence things will become less because the resentment will be greater. They, as I said, they will ask, uh, they'll remember not what we did, but what we didn't do. That's what's going to determine the attitude in many cases towards the towards the US and under that situation then the US ability to to uh, shape and influence things in a positive direction is uh, less I think my general s feeling is that the situation after the election will deteriorate to the point where the US will be forced to recognize what I've said, the, the essence of what I've said, that they will begin to recognize that the longer they wait, uh, the less uh, chance they have of uh, influencing things in, a, in any kind of a positive d direction. I can't guarantee that, that that will happen, but I think that is the, the situation. And in a way, Obama faced a somewhat similar, there are a lot of differences between Libya and uh, Syria. You don't have to discuss them. But in a way, he faced a somewhat similar situation in Libya. And he decided, for reasons that made sense to me, uh, that the United States could not sit back and watch while what looked likely to be a kind of massacre uh, by Gaddafi of the opposition. But he said and made very clear that the United States would get involved militarily, provide certain capabilities which only the United States could provide at the, in the initial stage, but that we were going to turn the leadership over to NATO and to the European allies. And w the difference, I would say, between one of the differences between Libya and Syria is, first of all, of course, Syria is a much bigger country. Its military is extremely, uh, one of the strongest in the region, and, and certainly can't compare Libyan military in any way to that. It has a very uh, good air defense uh, system. So the military complexities of trying to get involved are militarily for the U.S. and for establishing a no-fly uh, uh, zone are quite diff difficult. In the Libyan case, we were able to get a uh, mandate for a, a UN mandate, limited, constrained, but nonetheless uh, you had that. Uh, and you had the uh, backing uh, of the Arab League. So that was a completely different situation than you have. You don't have the UN uh, mandate possibility because of R Russia and China veto. You don't have the Arab League uh, backing, you have a much more complex military situation. But that said, uh, you did have in the Libyan uh, circumstance a desire by some Europeans, particularly the British and French, 
to take a rather assertive role. And in fact, uh, they did do it in uh, Libya, though it turned out that uh, their military capabilities were far less than they thought. And therefore, the United States behind the scenes still had to do a lot, a lot more. In the Syrian case, with the exception of the French, uh, you see no willingness on the part of any of the uh, NATO allies to take any military action. So that is a different... Um, of course, you haven't had the United States pushing for military action because if you did, you probably would be able to get more support than you've gotten now. But the situation is again quite different and there is not uh, a strong European willingness uh, to do very much. The, and they are now facing a kind of existential crisis economically which has major implications for the future of the European Union and which deflects uh, their attention both from the Middle East uh, and also makes it militarily very difficult for them to do very much. So that as the, the, the beginnings of that were there invisible during, during Libya, Libyan crisis, but in the meantime that European context has changed uh, significantly. On the, the oh, yeah. caretake transitional government and, and Assad stepping aside, the proposals for, was for Assad to step aside and to be replaced by the Shark, the, Sh Sh the, the foreign, former, the vice president, former foreign minister. Yeah. Well, it's all good and well, but I don't think uh, Assad <laughs> is going to do that. And I don't see how it's going, uh, going to happen. Uh, so, I mean, yes, good to try, uh, but uh, Assad has shown no interest in stepping down. He's completely um, rejected the advice uh, that Devatoglu and Erdogan gave during the period from March 2011 until uh, the fall of, or to the end of uh, the, uh, to the visit by Devatoglu to uh, Damascus. So I don't see any reason why there's, uh, this should work any more than any of the other proposals that have been put forward. But if it, if Fassad were willing to do it, it would certainly be a step in the right direction. I'm afraid I think I've gotten the signal that we have to close it down here. Three or four minutes, we'll take one more. James Kitfield from National Journal. <coughs> yeah, okay. Um, my question to you is, you know, if you could play out a little bit more of not doing anything and how that impacts U.S.-Turkish relations, because that stri strikes me beyond whether Turkey goes nuclear in response to Iran going nuclear, strikes me at a time when we're saying Turkey is the model for an Islamic democracy. If we abandon it at its hour of need, there will be repercussions to that. Uh, and secondly, I don't see how arming the rebels gets the job done here. It seems to me that something like a Libyan model would have to be required, but I'd be curious whether you agree. If we could make it quick, because... Okay, I, mean I, I would say it'll have repercussions on the Turkish-U.S. relations. It already has, and it's unfortunate because U.S.-Turkish relations over the last year or two, two have improved very significantly. There's a very good dialogue between uh, in relationship between Erdogan and uh, uh, Obama. But Turkey is very exposed in, uh, in this. Some of it's its own fault because it miscalculated. Uh, but the perception in the Turkish public and in the elite of how much they can rely on the United States and what is the meaning of the relationship with the United States is uh, very much at, uh, at stake. So that these strains uh, are likely to continue in, unless there is a more, a greater meeting of the, 
of the minds. Uh, again, I, and I'll just conclude on that, I think, you, you know, the best solution uh, would be if the United States were willing to set up a no-fly zone. Probably that, well, I don't say the best solution, but that certainly would be the one that could turn the tide of battle more. But it is also the most difficult. I mean, you're asking, don't forget this, you're asking essentially the United States to attack Syrian air defense. That's an act of war. I mean, that's what, 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 what we would be doing. Now, it may come to that, but I have sympathy with the administration because everybody talks about setting up a no-fly zone without really recognizing what the consequences of that are. And even look at it for a little bit from the Russian si side. The Russians kind of think, well, no UN mandate. The United States just going around decides that it's going to for whatever reason, uh, doesn't like Syria, boom, there comes on a fly zone. When's, when are they going to do that again? Or from the vice versa, from the United States position. Supposing Russia were to do something someplace, and they decided that uh, they didn't like what was going on, and they decided to do a new, no fly zone against, I don't know, some other co country, uh, in the, in the Middle East, let's say Libya. You know, they just decide on their own, own that their national interests require them to do that. And we would be the first to say, well, what about international law? What about the, uh, the UN? So there are consequences and costs at the same time of, uh, of doing these uh, type of actions. But at some point, the United States will have to decide where its interests really lie and how bad the situation can get if they don't take action. And I fear, and if you look at the potential for destabilization and the importance of the region uh, and the issues at stake, I think uh, letting this crisis go on like this uh, will destabilize the region. Uh, it will have consequences not only for our relationship with Turkey, but it, you will have a, a, a spillover into uh, Lebanon, and you, you are having these issues are very closely uh, interconnected. The same with the the Kurdish issue. The, the longer we wait, it would, or even Turkey. Turkey now is uh, paying the price for not taking more assertive action to deal with the Kurdish problem, uh, which cannot be resolved militarily. It is a political, social problem. It can only be resolved politically and through social and other uh, issues. If Turkey had taken the, uh, the issue more seriously, it would be in a better position now to withstand a lot of the shocks that uh, are going on. But the fact that it didn't uh, now puts it in a very difficult position, and I fear that the United States will face the same type of uh, situation. Thank you so very much. I mean, there's so much more to discuss. I, I'll just leave with this sort of negative note. Um, we have a story today from our, uh, uh, our correspondent based in Istanbul that suggests that uh, the vote that was held by the Turkish parliament authorizing uh, the use of force and the deployment of Turkish military assets uh, could just as likely be used to go after the Kurds, and particularly the Kurdish pocket that's been created in northern Syria. Uh, as it is to go after, to, to pursue some kind of intervention in Syria. So thank you so very okay. much. Sorry I can't be more <laughs> optimistic. <laughs> <laughs>